But here, you can do it with impunity. So we, we, we do have a problem with the rule of law here. And that is one of the uh, key areas that I've been working on. Uh, and I'm saying we need to deal with the rats and mice before we can deal with the cats. And if we can deal with the rats and mice and deal with the little crimes, the big crimes will become more obvious and it'll be easier to prosecute. Hello, my name is Donald, and today we're going to dive deep into the world of corruption and criminality in South Africa. You are watching Worldview, where we explore everyone's perspectives on all things that can broaden our world view. Today we're talking with Paul O'Sullivan. Paul's connected to Paul O'Sullivan and Associates, an organization that is the leading expert in forensic and fraud investigation in South Africa. Paul, good morning, welcome, and I'm glad to see you are still alive. Yeah, uh, COVID, uh, it, it touched me briefly, but uh, after a week I was clear of it and thank God I can carry on. Oh, well, I mean, I, I was specifically um, talking about uh, attempted um, attempts to murder you, but okay, I, I didn't know that. But if, if, if we can move to a very interesting conversation you had on Biz News, a, a viral interview where you casually brushed over that you were once uh, pulled off a plane in 2016 and tortured. C can you tell us that story? What happened there? Yeah, so I think in March 2016, um, on the 15th of March, in fact, I sent an email to the chief of police and to the deputy president of the country. He was copied on it. And in that email, I made it crystal clear that I was intending to hold a press conference on the 4th of um, April in Whitehall. And the purpose of the press conference was to announce that the the government in South Africa uh, had been captured by criminals and that the police uh, were part of it and that the country was corrupt and that my intention was to say that people should not invest in South Africa until the, the back had been broken on the corruption that was taking place in the country. And I also linked some senior police officer who I mentioned at the time, uh, who was involved with other people and I knew that those other people were involved in money laundering for Al Qaeda. So I said it was an unsavory situation and it need to be it need to be stopped. And in the same email, I sent uh, a photograph of the mansion in which the chief of police lives. And I said to him, I'd like you to explain where you got the money from to buy that house. Uh, because uh, I was satisfied that it had been purchased with the proceeds of crime. And I told them uh, in the email that I was flying out on the 1st of April in the evening. I gave them the flight number and I said to them, go do what you did to the uh, people who, who fought against apartheid. Go drag me off the plane, stop me from flying and see what happens. And they did. So... Um, I was sitting on the plane with my two young children, uh, one aged eight and one aged nine, and they yanked me off the plane. They tortured me uh, by keeping me in inhuman conditions for three days. And then they kept my passports and they released me and I couldn't leave the country. I was stuck in South Africa. So they were doing exactly what they used to do to the apartheid. Uh, the people that were standing up against apartheid. And um, I wasn't allowed freedom of movement. I couldn't go outside of the area where I lived. I wasn't allowed, for example, to go on a plane to Cape Town. I couldn't uh, go on a plane to London. I was stuck in the country. Um, and I had to spend a lot of money and take a lot of time in court in order for all of this to be uh, removed from my shoulders. And um, now I'm suing the government and the people that were involved for an amount of about 160-ish uh, million rand. That's incredible. And uh, can you tell us who are these people that were involved in that? Well, the chief of police, um, the president of the country, the head of intelligence in the country, 
the Minister of Intelligence, a guy by the name of uh, David McClover. Um, so pretty much all of the people that were involved in what I class as organized crime uh, at a political level within South Africa. And I had been for several years uh, taking steps to expose these people. And if you look on, so I, apart from my forensic practice, I run a charity called Forensics for Justice. And Forensics for Justice have a, have a website. And if you look on our website, you can see some of the cases we were involved in. Uh, for example, uh, the mistress of the president is a woman called, or one of the many mistresses of the president is a woman by the name of Duda Mayeni. And she at the time was the chairman of South African Airways. And she was doing nothing more or less than stealing from the airline and driving it into bankruptcy. And uh, I made it clear, I opened a criminal docket against her uh, in March, also several weeks before I was dragged off the plane. And I made it clear in that criminal docket that uh, she was involved in corrupt practices. Um, so I also targeted Lucky Montana, um, who had been involved in, um, shall I say, fleecing the National uh, Rail Agency of South Africa, which is called PRASA, the Passenger Rail Agency of South Africa. He had fleeced out of about four billion rand. And... Uh, graciously shared some of the spoils of his corruption uh, with the president of the country. Uh, so the pattern that was emerging in South Africa was that you were allowed to be corrupt, provided you shared some of the proceeds with, with uh, number one. Now, anybody that was around in the, in, the, in the States in the last 100 years would know that fits exactly the modus operandi of uh, a mafia-like crime syndicate, where you can go and commit crime and you're immune to prosecution, you're immune to any, any treatment at all, providing you pay your dues. And that's what's been going on in South Africa. But I mean, to torture someone is an extremely arrogant act. And some would say even stupid, because obviously if you get away, now you tell everyone the story. I mean, it's potentially smarter to kill someone. Do you, do you know that, do you know of everyone else that has been treated like you have been treated? Or is I, this don't a... I don't actually. I think the problem is, um, I was a bit of a, a strange card for them because there were honest policemen and there were honest prosecutors and there were other honest people within government circles who also wanted to stand up against corruption. And what happened to them was they, they lost their jobs. Now, I wasn't a government employee. I was running a charity which was exposing corruption. So I hadn't done uh, or wasn't receiving any public funds. I, you know, I wasn't getting a salary from the taxpayer. In fact, I was a taxpayer contri contributor uh, in my business life. Uh, my forensic practice was contributing several million rand a year in taxes. So um, I was a taxpayer rather than a civil servant. Now, all the civil servants that were involved, um, they lost their jobs. They, they were targeted, they were suspended, and they were fired on, under false circumstances. And that included some very senior police officers. You know, the, 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 those police officers lost their jobs. Now, they couldn't fire me because I wasn't working for them. So they decided instead to set me up on fake criminal charges. Um, and that campaign against me started um, with my arrest and being dragged off the plane and went on for several years. I had to uh, appear in court, I think 160 times over three years um, on, on different trials and different charges. Uh, they, they alleged I was involved in treason, um, racketeering, espionage, um, extortion, kidnapping, uh, every fraud, everything you can possibly think of, I got charged with it. Um, I think they didn't charge me with murder. 
Um, but they charged me with pretty much everything else they could think of to charge me with. And one by one, all of these cases unraveled in court and the judges made scathing findings against them when the cases were dismissed. So um, now I, I'm not facing any charges at all. I've been acquitted on all the charges I was charged with. And if I wasn't acquitted, they were just thrown out of court. They were removed from the role. So now they have a problem because they failed to silence me. And now I'm more vocal than ever in exposing them. And now they're afraid to come near me. So they're afraid to bring any more fake criminal charges against me because they got such a hiding the last time. But, but on a more serious note, in that interview for Biz News, you mentioned that um, you are targeted and there are people that might that are trying to kill you. Um, do you have some evidence of that, stories of that? Well, how do you know people are trying to get rid of you? Well, when people get arrested for carrying out surveillance in the street where I live, and they're found in possession, illegal possession of firearms and blue lights in their vehicles, um, and then we got inside people of the crime syndicate involved who become state witnesses, and they give sworn statements, which details in quite some detail about how they were planning to kill me. I think um, the evidence is all there. We have a, a colonel, a lieutenant colonel in crime intelligence, who's provided a very detailed sworn statement um, to the uh, oversight judge of the Directorate for Priority Crime Investigation. Now, that judge issued a judgment a few months ago, which was a scathing attack on some generals in the police, which clearly implicates them in being involved in going after this Lieutenant Colonel for no other reason than she came to me to warn me that there was going to be an attempt to kill me. So uh, the evidence is all out there and it's not, um, it's not anecdotal evidence, it's prima facie evidence. So there are a number of people at this very moment in time awaiting trial for conspiring to murder me. And uh, did this happen during Ramaphosa's presidency or during Zuma's presidency? Has anything changed? Uh, well, it happened during Zuma's presidency. I'm not aware, uh, since Ramaphosa took over, I'm not aware of any um, attempt by anybody to kill me. Although um, I can imagine there would be a few out there that would, would probably not lose any sleep um, if something did happen to me. Hmm. And if we can pivot to a person that is seen as the kingpin of corruption, Ace Mahashule, um, he has been recently suspended from his position as the Secretary General of the ANC. And his defense to all these charges are they are singling me out. There are a lot of people, if the allegations are true, that are potentially more corrupt than I am. W what is your response to that um, criticism? Do you think that's a valid response to say to all these charges against you? Yeah, I think he's probably right. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think there's a lot of people um, who have held high office in the ANC, including cabinet posts who are rotten to the core and patently extremely corrupt. And they've not yet been arrested and charged. So yeah, if I had a, sh a shopping list of the people I would go after, uh, I'd say Esma Khashuli uh, might be on the list, but he certainly wouldn't be uh, towards the top of the list where I can think of a number of people that should have been arrested and charged already, and they haven't. And so do you think it's political and not, um it's not corrupted rated it's it's they're trying to get rid of them because of his political connections no I, I i don't think that would be fair um the national prosecuting authority as it stands today um the leadership of the national prosecuting authority uh they will not take instructions from um from political leaders maybe they would have done during Sumer's time in fact they did you know uh, it's a known fact that the National Prosecuting Authority was captured. But today, I don't think they would take instructions from political leaders. Now, 
I have no insight into the charges of Makashuli. I've not investigated those charges in any way, so I cannot uh, say this or that about those particular charges. Um, but I think it would be I think it would be a wrong call on his side uh, to assume that the charges are political charges um, because isn't that exactly what Zuma is also saying that all the charges against him are political and yet those charges go back more than 20 years you know so um, it's very strange um, if anybody could claim that their charges were political I, I, I have the right to lay that claim against the charges that were laid against me because it, they were driven by politicians um, in fact the very last case that was opened against me were ANC MPs uh, who opened a case against me in Cape Town, alleging that I was interfering with their ability to make decisions in Parliament, uh, which was completely uh, pathetic. And that case was also, I, I didn't even give a, a statement on that case. They asked me to give a warning statement and I wrote and I told them to get lost. And I set out why I was telling them to get lost. And then I sent that to the head of the prosecution service, um, Advocate uh, Batowi. And a few weeks later, I got a letter from one of her deputies telling me that they had taken a decision not to prosecute that, that allegation. So I don't think it's wise of ACE to say that the charges against him are political because that insinuates that either Ramaphosa or one of his colleagues is now controlling the NPA. And if you look at the Act, the National Prosecuting Authority Act makes it clear that they must act independent of the executive. Mm. And uh, there might be people that are more corrupt, but eventually you have to start somewhere. But um, if we can pivot to our deputy president, David Mabuza, not a lot of people know about this character. I mean, he suddenly became the second most powerful figure in South Africa. The, the, he holds the second most powerful position political office. Do you, can you tell us some stories and you know, some stories about the cat, that's it's his nickname, about David Mabuza? Who is this David Mabuza? Well, he, he was, I guess, you know, he took over from uh, Matthew Sposa many years ago as Premier of Mpumalanga. Now, I often refer to Mpumalanga as the Potol province. And there's a reason why I call it the Potol province, because all the money that was supposed to be used to maintain the roads was stolen, and therefore the roads are full of potholes. Now, um, Matthews Posa, when Matthews Posa was the premier of um, Mpumalanga, uh, David Mabuza was the MEC for Agriculture. While he was MEC for Agriculture, he got embroiled in some uh, land, uh, shall we say, land restitution claims. Now, there's an act called the uh, Restitution of Land Act or something like that. I can't remember the exact wording. Uh, and that act says that if your land was taken off you, by an apartheid government and you're a person of color and your land was taken off you after uh, the union of uh, of south africa in other words after south africa became the union of south africa which i think was uh, 20 uh, sorry 1913 or 1916 somewhere around there so after that cutoff date if the land was taken away from you by the government and you weren't you know if it was taken off you but you weren't paid for it um then you would have the right in terms of the land restitution act you would have the right to claim that land back now a number of individuals started claiming land back that they never had in the first place and a lot of that happened in pumalanga so you had a group of people who got together in fact, the way I saw it, <clears throat> it was driven by an Afrikaans guy who the story I paint or the picture I paint is that he rode into town and he tied his horse up outside the saloon in Bud Plus. Of course, it's a 
you know, a rhetorical horse and a rhetorical saloon. Mm. It was it was probably a shabin. And he walked in there and he said, any of you guys want to be farmers? And, you know, on a Friday night, I suppose at 10 o'clock at night, you're going to find a lot of people in a shabin. That if you ask them if they want to be farmers, they would probably put their hand up. So he then persuaded them all to give them him uh, copies of IDs. And he, he accumulated a number of ID uh, books, uh, copies of ID books with names of individuals and their ID number and their date of birth and so on and so forth. And he put them into different categories. And he assisted these people to, f to, to, to create a trust. Uh, and this trust which he funded, then laid claim to all the land in the Bad Plus Valley, which was a significant amount of land. And um, as a result, uh, he was then going to the white farmers, the Afrikaans farmers who had this land. And he would say to them, um, and by the way, this coincided with a period in our government where they were pulling back on subsidies to farmers. So farmers in South Africa traditionally under the uh, National Party would receive um, subsidies to ensure that the food chain uh, stayed in place. So there, there wasn't as much, shall we say, free market competition as there should be. Hmm. And the, a, lot of, a lot of the farmers were being subsidized. So in the early part of this century, the ANC government started gradually removing these subsidies. And now some of these farmers became what can best be described as marginal farmers. You know, they were, if they were making money at all, um, they were lucky. And a lot of them were just making enough money to, to keep the roof over their head. And they couldn't invest in new uh, technology or new equipment. So they were ripe for what happened. And this guy would go along to these farmers and tell them, listen, yeah, I'll buy your farm off you. And let's say hypothetically farm A was worth a million rand. He would offer them 1.5 million rand. And they knew that was half a million more than it was worth. But he would sign a contract and tell them, that in the contract that they could not object to any land restitution claim on the farm. And the contract would only become complete when the land restitution claims were finalized. So when he had tied up a whole lot of farmers on deals like this, he then got this, this fake, well, it wasn't fake, it was real, but it was founded on a fake basis, this community trust of black, uh, uh, black owned uh, community trust, where these people put a fake claim together saying that they were kicked off their land uh, by white farmers uh, who took over their land. And then uh, money obviously changed hands and this claim went through the land restitution uh, process. It was advertised in the media as it's supposed to be done and gazetted. And then uh, all, these, all these farms were, were compulsorily purchased by the land uh, restitution, the local uh, regional land claims committee, uh, got money from the taxpayer and they paid for these farms. But farmer A will go back to him, who signed a contract for 1.5 million um, he wasn't the person that received the proceeds of sale. He only got his 1.5 million. The land was actually sold for 6 million, or in some cases, 8 million. It was sold for 2,000% more in the worst possible case. It was sold for 2,000% more than it was worth. So you had this situation where all the values of the land were inflated and the valuations were carried out by a particular valuator and they were all of them inflated and coincidentally the inflated values uh, were the amounts that were paid to this middleman who'd entered into all the contracts 
But the piece of the jigsaw that helped this whole thing go through was the MEC, the minister, uh, the, the member of the executive council for Pumalanga, responsible for agriculture, was signing off on documents which were fraudulent, which enabled all of these transactions to come to fruition. So um, this raised its head recently in a court case. And um, the lawyer of David Mabuza was desperate to try and suppress the evidence coming out, but he couldn't, it came out. So I think uh, that's a bit of a story to tell. Then you have another interesting story to tell involving David Mabuza, and we call it, um, <laughs> it's, it's a sexy story. It's about the butler, you know, and the butler uh, created a fake story which found its way into the hands of a Matthews Pausa, and Matthews Pausa published it because he'd fallen out with David Mabuza. And the butler then became a witness in a, in a defamation case. Um, and the butler came to see me afterwards and told me that he'd been paid bribes to by David Mabuza through his attorney uh, to give false evidence in the case. And he gave the false evidence, he received the money, but the judge was able to see through the false evidence and labeled him a liar. So, you know, that's another little story we have, which is, is very interesting. And for some reason, hasn't found itself into a criminal court yet, because if you pay a witness to uh, say things in court, that's, that's an offense, you know, you're defeating mm. or obstructing the ends of justice. Now, then of course you have the case about the robbery that took place at David Mabuza's luxury home in Pumalanga. And in the police report, he, he mentioned that uh, a large amount of cash was stolen, running into millions of rand. Now, the whole country started asking questions. Well, hang on a minute, you're a politician. What are you doing with millions of rand of cash in your house? No answer. That whole thing went quiet, you know, and the docket, the investigation for the robbery of his house, I think, uh, David Mabuse is quite happy that the police were never able to locate the suspects because somebody would then say, well, where did all this money come from? So there are these questions hanging over him. Um, and I guess sooner or later, he's going to have to answer them. Mm, and it's frightening. I mean, he's just a bullet away from becoming president. But is, aren't there also some stories about political assassinations connected with David Mabuza? Well, they are that. They are just stories, you know, they're hearsay. And, you know, I'm a factual person, I'm a forensic consultant, and I prefer to stick to stuff which I either know about and rather than propagate um, hearsay stories. But there have been, without a doubt, a lot of assassinations um, in Pumalanga, and there are allegations, and that's all they are. I've never seen any evidence. There are allegations that somehow, somewhere, David Mabuza has a finger in the pie. Hmm. So it is widely known that Mabuza basically gave Ramaphosa the presidency, the presidency of the ANC. He was, his province was the deciding vote. What do you think was promised to Mabuza to, in exchange for Ramaphosa's presidency? Well, I think deputy president, that's what it came to, you know, um, people refer to him as the kingmaker. He was referring to himself as the kingmaker. And what he did was he took, which is patently a corrupt system anyway, which is the ANC internal elections. Um, and they are patently corrupt. You know, money changes hands and people vote. Now that's corrupt. And I think on, on this occasion, um, he was able to swing the vote towards Ramaphosa. And in return, he became deputy president. Now, if he doesn't become the next president, he would have broken the cycle because up until now, 
the deputy president always becomes the president. Mm. On the other side of the coin, if he does become the president, a lot of people in South Africa have got to be very, very worried because however bad we think Jacob Zuma was, um, David Mabuza um, will be far, far worse. Oh, why do you say that? Because they don't call him the cat for nothing. You know, uh, it's very wily, it's very slippery. And, um, you know, you just got to look at the messages he's been putting out. He's trying to give the impression that he's a good guy. Um, what's he been doing trotting up to Russia for treatment on alleged food poisoning or something like that? You know, there, there are a lot of unanswered questions about this guy um, and his association with certain people. And some of those people are very sleazy people indeed. Now, when you lie down with dogs, you get fleas. And one has to wonder why our deputy president is lying down with some of the people he's lying down with. Mm. So you, you can basically refer to him as a smarter version of Zuma, which would be a disaster to South Africa. Um, but a lot of people, our viewers, would be very interested to hear about the underworld, these, these figures that commit these murders, these political assassinations. Do you know how this underworld operates? How does a person like Mabuza or Ace Mahashule, if they want to murder someone, how do they carry that out? What is the process involved? Well, it's very simple. They hire, they hire hitmen to go and kill people. I mean, um, you know, we have a very high level of unemployment in this country. Uh, guns are readily available on the black market. So, unfortunately, well, fortunately, most of these so-called um, guns for hire, they are, for the most part, they're quite incompetent. Um, I mean, there have been several attempts on my life and, you know, they haven't even come close. Uh, so unfortunately, um, there are a number of people around who don't have any money and they're prepared to kill for money. So they, you, you can hire people to kill. And that's what's been going on. And these would be former police officers? Uh, not always. Some of them may be. Others might be ex-army. You know, what you have to remember during the apartheid days, um, the National uh, Party government were very good at training black people to be traitors and to and kill each other. You know, um, so the skills were put there by the apartheid government, and those skills are still around now. Um, if a person's got no money and somebody offers him a bag full of money to go and kill somebody and then tells him he'll get another bag when the job is done, um, there you go. It's quite a straightforward process. Okay. And, the pro and, and the problem is the, the people who are out there involved in hanky-panky, they know this. So you and me and all the other taxpayers, we're paying for their bodyguards because they, they're afraid to go around without bodyguards. So um, the, the people involved in the most hanky-panky have the most bodyguards. Mm. So on that note, a lot of people in South Africa are very de dejected with the state of crime in South Africa. But in your speech to Biz News, you made a very interesting point where you compared the UK with South Africa and the criminal prosecution um, rate in the UK. That, 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 and you, you illustrated that things in the first world countries are not that great, especially in the UK. Can you, can you tell us a bit that story? I'll, um, crime is also a problem in the UK. Well, crime is a massive problem in the UK. It's a monstrous problem. In fact, it's reached uh, a situation now where you go to the police station, you tell them you want to open a docket, they chase you away. Um, how do I know that? Because a crime took place in, the, in, in a, a place where I was a few weeks ago in the UK, and I went to the police station to report it. They weren't interested. You know, uh, they said, are you the victim of the crime? I said, no, but I saw the crime taking place. And they said, well, what happened? I said, well, uh, people were buying drugs in the street. And uh, I've, I managed to get a photograph of the car. Here it is. And they said, no. Nah, 
uh, you, can, you can go online, you can file a complaint online. I said, okay, but here I am now. Here's the photograph, here's my camera. You know, they said, no, um, we don't have time. Sorry, we don't have the resources for that. I looked at the home office figures. You know, in, in South Africa, we have a minister of police. Bad one at that, but that's another story for another day. In the UK, they have what they call the home office. And the home office is responsible uh, for the following areas of government in the UK, and that's police and immigration services and border control. So they're responsible, the Home Office is responsible for that. And the immigration services, obviously, you know, if you're an illegal immigrant, you fall under the uh, border police and the Home Office is responsible for the border police. And they issue statistics every year. When I gave that presentation, at Alex Business Conference. It was last year in, I think, August or September. It was a year ago. So I was using, and I pulled out the, um, the stats that I got, okay? And I'm looking at them now. I've placed them on the table in front of me. And for South Africa, we have what we call a detection rate. Now, every country works differently the way in which they handle crime statistics. Mm. In South Africa, we have what we call a detection rate, and that means where somebody, where there's a detection and somebody is charged for the crime. And then we have a detection rate uh, in South Africa as well, in, uh, in the UK as well, where somebody gets charged for the crime. And if I look at the detection rates in the UK, and we've got the years, the last five years, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. In the year 15, it was 15.5% detection rate. That means somebody was charged for the crime. Uh, in the year 16, 2016, it was 13.1%. 17, it was 11.2%. 18, it was 9.1%. And in 19, it hit 7.8%. Wow. Now, the good news for the UK, that, or they think it's a good news, is that in 2020, it turned around and it, it went rapidly up to over 20%. Um, but the reason for that is because most of the people were in lockdown and the police were on the streets and, and they were suppressing the crime. So they were catching people on the streets when they shouldn't be on the streets and they were involved in crime. So the detection rate went up. But if you take COVID out of the picture, I'm pretty sure the rates were still going down. And then I analyzed gun crime and knife crime. So gun crime is sitting around about the seven and a half, eight thousand a year gun crimes in the UK. And it's been pretty stable at that. The figures in 29 are pretty much the same as they were in, uh, sorry, in 2019 are pretty much the same as they were um, in 2011, which is around about the seven to 8,000 crimes per annum. But the knife crime in the UK in 2013 was sitting at 22,000 crimes a year. And in 2019, it's doubled to 44,000 knife crimes a year. So there's been a massive increase uh, in the amount of knife crime to the extent where pretty much every day on the news in the UK, um, somebody died, you know, with a stabbing. And uh, there are areas in London and some of the other big cities where the police are afraid to go unless there's... Uh, they, they go in a vehicle, which is like a minibus, with six or eight of them in it. And the vehicle has got shields that drop down, metal screens in case they start throwing stones at the vehicle. And in some areas of the UK, the police are having to go into those areas to police those areas in those type of vehicles. And if they have to go into those areas to arrest somebody, they'll go in with 100, plus minus 100 police officers to affect a single arrest, because otherwise, when they go in there, they're going to be attacked. So that's just the UK. You know, I was in the US a few years ago. Oh, 95%, by the way, 
I'm just looking at this figure here. 95% of UK burglaries and robberies are not solved. 95%. So although the overall detection rate was 7.8% in 2019, the detection rate for burglaries and robberies is only 5%. And that, that should be a worrying figure. Um, and then, of course, you've got in the States. A couple of years ago, I was in the States and I was in Chicago and I was pulling onto the freeway. And it was one of these locations where the freeway is busy during the peak hour and they have a green light and a red light at the freeway entrance. So you're on this on-ramp, which is sliding down onto the freeway, and the red light goes to green, and four or five cars go through, and then it goes back to red again. And I was going down this, this ramp, and in front of me, uh, there was a, a limousine with tinted windows, and in front of that were another few cars. And it, the light went to green, and the car in front of the limousine wasn't awake. And it went to red again before that car could go. And the limousine driver was blowing his horn at the, um, the driver in front. And the driver in front opened his window and stuck up his middle finger. And the limousine, the limousine then pulled to the side of that car and went around him. And as it went around him, the back window came down and the car was machine gunned and the guy was killed. Now, that was in Chicago, and that was like two or three years ago. So, um, you know, you get killed there for throwing a middle finger at somebody. Um, you, you, it can happen here too. I mean, we do hear about it. But what I'm saying is the grass isn't always greener on the other side of the street. And yes, we do have a crime problem, and I would never try to minimize it. Um, the, the, the problem is a lot worse than it should be because of the levels of incompetence and mismanagement by successive chiefs of police. Hmm. And could one say that essentially the real difference between the UK and South Africa is South Africa just has a higher level of violent crime. That's really the problem in South Africa. Yes, plus we have a rule of law here which is more effective. Um, you know, I'll give you a classic example. If you, if you get caught speeding in the UK, you're going to get instant justice. You know, you get caught speeding here. You know, I don't know. You, you have you, to pay you a bribe. Well, you, or, or you get a ticket some, you know, sometime later. Um, you know, I don't know. That's just that. Um, in certain municipalities, if you, if you break the municipal regulations um, in South Africa, certain municipalities, they jump quickly. Um, it, it's, it's the broken window concept, which was made famous in New York um, by the, the, the chief of police in New York about 20 years ago, um, where he said, if you find a broken window on a building, he's going to issue a fine against the owner of the building. And that forced the owners to fix up their buildings, and that reduced the level of crime. Well, if you go downtown into Johannesburg, downtown Johannesburg, there's no rule of law. I see um, well, you don't even have to go downtown. You can see it in the local streets. You see uh, taxi drivers jumping the lights or driving on the wrong side of the road in front of traffic cops, and the traffic cops don't do anything about it. So that means there's a problem with the rule of law. You do that in the UK or the United States, you're going to get arrested, um, and you're going to have to pay a fine and, and you know, uh, get your license stamped or whatever. But here, you can do it with impunity. So we, we, we do have a problem with the rule of law here. And that is one of the uh, key areas that I've been working on. Uh, and I'm saying we need to deal with the rats and mice before we can deal with the cats. And if we can deal with the rats and mice and deal with the little crimes, the big crimes will become more obvious and it'll be easier to prosecute. Um, you, you know, most of the crimes that take place today, most of them, I'm not talking about fraud and corruption, but the, the, the visible crime, the contact crime, a lot of that contact crime involves vehicles. So, you know, if you go to rob a bank, your getaway car is a vehicle. You know, you've got a getaway car. Now, if they, if they clamp down on vehicle crime, 
and they cramp down on all these taxi drivers to break the law. You get a traffic jam on the freeway. Um, the hard shoulder, which is supposed to be an emergency lane for, you know, if there's an accident and the ambulance have to come through, they got to get past all these taxis, which are using the emergency lane. And then people sit there and they watch all these taxis going through. And what does it do? It kind of saying to them, you know what? You can't break the law, but we can. And that's a problem. So the rule of law has to be uh, properly instilled in this country. And it doesn't help when you have a minister of police who goes onto the beach in Cape Town and instructs, unlawfully instructs police officials uh, to stop people from filming on the beach when they had a license to do just that. So you have this situation where they, for some reason, um, the rule of law is not being applied uh, methodically and properly. Mm. So let's say instead of Becky Chele, Paul O'Sullivan is now the Minister of Police. What would you do to system systemically fix the problem of policing in South Africa? Well, first of all, uh, I did still accountability within the police service. You know, I often, because we run a forensic practice, we often go into police stations and meet the police officials. And sometimes you go into a police station to open a criminal complaint. And you get some guy who's a constable at the desk who hasn't been properly trained and has the goal to tell you, no, you must go and open this at uh, another police station. Or, uh, for example, we, we have a complex fraud case which involves maybe a lever arch file containing 10 sworn statements which have all been meticulously typed out and sworn to. And here's the build up with all the evidence and here's your case. It's a complex fraud case. Now, don't matter what case you open, the starting point for opening that case, regardless of where it's investigated, is, is the police station in the jurisdiction where the offence took place. So you go into Santon Police Station and you get some twit behind the counter who says, uh, no, those are type statements. We only accept written statements, so we're going to have to write them all out for you. Hello? You know, there's a lack of training. There's a lack of... Uh, continuity. I had a meeting with a police official yesterday involving a robbery that took place. And the robbery uh, was a very violent robbery that took place over the weekend, this past weekend. And I met with the police officer who wants to investigate it. He's an investigating officer. And myself and one of my colleagues went through uh, to do some crime scene uh, review and analysis and try and work out what went on. And the problem is the, the, the level of crime, uh, the amount of criminal complaints that have to be dealt with by police officials is of such a level that they cannot give the desired amount of attention to each case that they are investigating. Now, one of the things I would do is I would have a uh, in, in, institute a process where a docket is reviewed by a seasoned professional. And that professional can look at that docket and determine whether there's a high chance of being able to find the suspect and get a successful prosecution or not. And if the answer is no, place the docket to one side and focus on the low hanging fruit. Go after the cases where you can get a suspect, you can lock somebody up. Go after the what I call the triage cases, the rapes, the robberies, the murders, um, and the high profile corruption and fraud cases. And if you do that, you know, if we talk about street crime, the visible crime, the man in the street sees uh, the hijacking of his car or the robbery of a bank or the, the, uh, the mugging where you get hit and they snatch your phone or your or lady's handbag or something like that. And that's visible crime. The invisible crime is your corruption and your fraud. Well, if I tell you that the fraud and corruption that takes place dwarfs the visible crime by a factor of at least 10, possibly even 20. In other words, if you take the rand value of all your robberies and all your thefts, you know, where somebody steals something, physically takes something, and, and you take the value, the rand value of all those crimes, 
in a year and add it together, it's a fraction, it's probably about 5% of the total value of all crime, which means 95% of all crime is white collar crime. Now we took a few cases as an example and we came to the conclusion that if all the white collar criminals stop committing crime tomorrow, it would take 17 and a half years to investigate and prosecute the backlog of crimes that are currently sitting out there. Wow. Now, if a person knows that he's only going to get prosecuted in 17 and a half years time, um, there's not really a disincentive for him not to commit crime. And then you have this situation where, for example, I call it the low hanging fruit, the National Prosecuting Authority. Um, there's a case running at the moment, it's been caught yesterday involving the previous chief of police. They call it the blue lights case. And it's my understanding that there's something like 170 charges that the accused are facing. Now, when I was a police official do, investigating fraud, I remember back in the early 90s, so it's like 30, almost 30 years ago, I did a case then where there was 1,800 charges. It took me three months to write the charge sheet. And after the guy was sent to prison, although he got 300 and something years in prison, it was an effective sentence of 15 years because he got uh, convicted of this for six months, convicted of that six months. You know, when you add the whole lot together, it was 360 something years. But the effective sentencing in terms of the summing up rules meant he only got 15 years in jail. And the judge came to me afterwards. He said, Paul, he said, you did a great job there. It was a good prosecution. Um, everything went down well. He said, but just let me give you some advice. That trial lasted three years. If you'd have charged him with 30 offenses instead of 1,800 offenses, the trial would have been over in a couple of months and he would have still got 15 years. We need to learn from that. I've suggested to the National Prosecuting Authority that they need to stop charging people with a thousand offenses or a hundred offenses. Pick four or five crisp, clean offenses. Charge them with those offenses. And if they only get five years or 10 years instead of 15 years, so what? Justice has been served because they've gone to prison and you can move on to the next one. And that way you can teach a lot more people a lesson than teaching a handful of people a big lesson, let's teach a lot more people a little lesson and send them away for five years instead of 10 or whatever the case may be. But get them into prison, get them convicted. And once they're convicted, they can never be in a position of trust again. So hopefully, uh, if, I, if I was in the position of Minister of Police, I would focus the police on in, in, in the fraud arena on charging people with five or 10 charges instead of 100 or 200 charges. Mm, that makes sense. And um, recently, Rob Hershoff, he, he did an interview speech at Biz News and it went viral. And in the speech, he said that um, South Africa came very close to becoming a police state. And um, a comparison he drew was with Turkey, where he says Erdogan basically has a police state in Turkey. Do you think our police and army is actually capable of creating a police state in South Africa? Because I personally don't think so. I, I think there's a massive difference between Turkey and South Africa. Do you think our police and army can create a police state here in South Africa? Yeah, I think maybe the way you're putting it, it's not quite the same. So we were almost a, a police state, but not a police state where the police are running the state. We were almost a police state where the leadership of the police, the leadership of the intelligence services, and the leadership of the prosecuting authority were charging people because they wanted to stop them from uncovering corruption. So that's how a police state comes about. And we were going in that direction. There's no doubt about it. But the same applies during the era of Jackie Salebi. I made the statement in 2006 that Jackie Salebi was taking South Africa towards a police state. Fortunately, he didn't get away with it. But when you have police, senior police officials making statements, for example, um, Jackie Salebi's spokesman at the time publicly stated that I would be arrested and charged. And I, they, even then, I'm going back 
you know, 15 years. They accused me of being a foreign spy that had come to South Africa to destabilize the police force. What a lot of rubbish, you know, a load of poppycock. I wanted to rid the police force of corruption. Why? Because in my interest and in the interest of everybody else in, in South Africa, that we have effective policing in this country. And you can't have effective policing when you've got a chief of police on the payroll of the mafia, which is what we had. And we have had many times since then, by the way. Um, and then it became worse because we had the Minister of Police, uh, the previous Minister of the Police, we had the Prosecution Authority, we had Chiefs of Police, all of them on the payroll of, of criminal crime syndicates. Now, when you're, when you're policing and your prosecution service are on the payroll of crime syndicates, it's a police state because the people who pay get policing and the people who don't, don't get policing. And you end up in a situation where those that have got money and can afford it can have armed guards outside their houses. But what about all the poor people? They're the real victims of Suma's corrupt government, are the poor people. People like us, we are also victims. When I say us, I'm not talking white people, I'm talking about business people or middle, middle, um, middle class people, people who can afford to have armed guards and uh, alarm systems and electric fences. We are lucky we can afford those things. What about the people who can't afford those things? Those are the people that have had their future stolen by a corrupt Zuma government. Those are the people that sadly will be re-voting for the ANC. They'll be voting for more of what they've had. It's like the story of the, the, the forest. You know, I've often repeated this, that the forest votes for the ax. The trees vote for the ax until there's no forest left. And the reason they keep voting for the ax is because the handle of the ax is made of one of them. You know, at the end of the day, um, they will vote, if they continue voting for a corrupt government, they will vote this country down the tubes. The only way to save South Africa is to vote for a new, less corrupt form of government. You know, I don't think there's a corrupt free form of government because all politicians in some way or another are corrupt. But what we had for the last 10 years, or for the last decade, you know, the Zuma era, the last decade, what we had there was rampant corruption. They have brought every state-owned company to its knees. The balance sheet of every state-owned company is negative. There's not one that's positive. 10 years ago, when Zuma came into power, most of those balance sheets were positive. So what he's in fact done is he's bankrupted the country. Mm. And I love that analogy you drew with the forest. Um, but I don't want to spend any more of your valuable time. One last question is relating to Herman Mashaba. Do you believe Herman Mashaba has a great record in terms of fighting corruption? Is that something you can stand on as mayor of Johannesburg? Yeah, yeah I do believe so. Um, you know, People are very quick to criticize when he was mayor of Johannesburg, he couldn't fix it. Well, the reason he couldn't fix it was because Johannesburg was a coalition. You know, in the same way that uh, Boris Johnson couldn't deliver Brexit because the government in the UK was a conservative coalition. He couldn't deliver Brexit because he couldn't get everybody to vote in favor of, they needed a majority for the Brexit deal and he couldn't get a majority. So he thought to hell with it, I'll have a general election. And when he got the general election, he had a landslide victory. He had more than enough votes, more than enough members of parliament, and I was able to push Brexit through. Uh, I'm not saying I'm in favor of Brexit. In fact, I think it was a big mistake, but the same applies in South Africa. If you've got a hung parliament, nothing gets done. Now, nothing was getting done in Johannesburg because you had these fringe, loony political parties who all wanted uh, seats in the political arena of Johannesburg far higher. They wanted far higher recognition than the number of seats they had. 
And when you're wheeling and dealing in an environment like that, you end up with a coalition where they are paralyzed. And that's what we had and still have, by the way. The, the coalition in Johannesburg, the ANC are currently running the show, but it was the DA, it could be somebody else. When these elections are out of the way, I'll be very happy if Herman Mashaba wins an outright majority. Uh, somehow, I don't think it's going to be happening because he doesn't just have to take away the ANC vote, he also has to take away the DA vote. So I think, sadly, he won't get an outright victory, but sadly, we will have another coalition government in Johannesburg. One thing is for certain, Johannesburg will not be run by a majority, outright majority ANC government, because the ANC have completely messed up Johannesburg. You know, the infrastructure in Johannesburg, the, the money that should have been spent on maintaining that infrastructure, they've been stealing it for the last 20 years. So you end up with a situation where we need to replace electrical, water, sewage, roads, everything is now in a position where it needs massive uh, recapitalization to get what was a world-class city back on its feet. Yeah, let's hope for change in the future. But Paul, thank you so much for your time. I want to give you one last opportunity to add, plug or say anything that you want to. Uh, just good luck, you know, um, and the people out there that listen to this, um, South Africa is still a great country. It's the best country in the world. And don't give in. Just remember, the best way to fight this is through the ballot box and roll your sleeves up if you know about crime reporting. Thanks very much. Thank you, Paul. And thank you so much for what you do and what your organization does. I think organizations like the one you represent and Afri Forum are really your, you have South Africa on your shoulders. But uh, to our viewers, um, if you've made it this far, please consider liking this video, sharing it as widely as possible, and subscribing to our channel. My name is Donald, and you've been watching Worldview.